Good morning. So, so, well, while I was the founder and CEO of this company called SRD, there came this day when I realized I was a crappy CEO. So I hired a real CEO to run the company. I demoted myself to chief scientist. His very first big move was tell me I was not a very good chairman of the board either. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> Anyway, we took two rounds of venture capital. IBM buys my company about 10 years ago, and uh, I've been having a lot of fun since. I'm, I've been mainly working on something called context computing. And what is that? Well, here's what that is. Let's say your organization has somebody subscribed to a newsletter, and all you've learned is an email address. You could use an infinite amount of compute, time, and energy. And what are the odds you're going to figure out if this is an opportunity or a risk? The problem is it lacks context. And when I say context, what do I mean? I mean this to better understand something by taking into account the things around it. When you see the word bat in a sentence, you look at the words around it to know what kind of bat it is. When I think about information in context, I think about taking that newsletter subscriber that just showed up and seeing how that data relates to the other observations that you've previously seen. And when you do that, you literally could use an original issue, 1983, IBM PC, and make a higher quality prediction about whether this yellow puzzle piece represents an opportunity or risk. Here's architecturally kind of how that looks. Here comes a new observation. It's from structured sources, unstructured sources. It might be a video in the parking lot that you put a license plate reader next to. And what you do is you take that, whether it's real time or batch, and you figure out how that relates to the things you've already seen. And then you take a chunk of that puzzle and this is that observation in context. It's like the word bat with the words around it. And this is the point where you insert the models. And what I see all too often is people trying to instrument and build algorithms on puzzle pieces too early in this process. I think about this as data finding data and things that relevant find you. This is the kind of architecture that allows you to get to sense and respond. Now, it turns out this puzzle metaphor holds up so well. I study the way people put puzzles together today, and it inspires me on the algorithms that my team and I are working on today. I want you to imagine this for a minute. A giant pile of puzzle pieces. Different colors, different sizes, different shapes. You don't have any covers of the boxes. You don't know if it's 50 puzzles or 500 puzzles. As you look at it, there's some duplicates. Some pieces are missing. You're even told some pieces are professionally fabricated lies. Until you start taking those puzzle pieces to the table, it's just almost impossible to figure out what you're dealing with. I went and bought these puzzles, and I hid 10% of the first puzzle, a third of the second, half of the third. I threw in a few random pieces from the fourth, and because I have a dark side, I bought a copy of the first puzzle and kept 10% of these pieces. I made a pile on my, at my girlfriend's house on our kitchen table. She was having a barbecue. I told them nothing. <laughs> my girlfriend sees her son and three cousins. I see four parallel processing pipelines. <laughs> These are the first two pieces of data that find each other. Here, more data finds more data. Here, I can see this duplicate at this point. They don't even know duplicates are possible until they find this piece here and stacked it up. But nonetheless, the puzzle began to take form. They started at 6.40. 22 minutes in, they said there's a duplicate. They had realized that. Then they realized some pieces were missing. 37 minutes in, it looks like a bunch of hillbillies on a porch. I was speaking in Eastern Europe. They didn't speak English well. I told them about hillbillies. They're people that have no teeth, live in the hills, make their own alcohol, and their family tree goes straight down. And it turns out everybody has hillbillies. <laughs> okay, I digress. They added a few more pieces, and a few minutes later, they realized this hillbillies playing guitar, sitting on a porch near a barber sign and a banjo, and this is all they could see. Underneath the bowl is the guitar, down below there the boots, off to the right the banjo. This is the puzzle that I denied them 50% of the observation space. In all four of the puzzle projects I've done, with less than 50% of the observation space, you can make an extraordinary claim about the overall scene, and I find that inspiring. 47 minutes in, they realized no matter how much energy they spent on connecting more sky and grass, it wasn't helping them better understand the scene. So they self-optimized and stopped applying any energy to those pieces. Two hours in, the oldest 17-year-old female at that time said, let's switch sides and see if we can make sense of this from different perspectives, because it was hard, and I thought that was really a genius uh, comment. They realized there was a fourth puzzle. Two hours and 18 minutes in, I think you threw in a few random pieces. Just a few minutes later, the oldest boy just looks at me and says, you're evil. And I'm like, I love this. <laughs> This was the puzzle that had only 10% of the pieces missing. 
Uh, I've done these experiments without any of the edges. It still works just as well. This, um, how context accumulates, how you put that puzzle together at home, and how it happens transactionally are so similar. I just want to step you through this real quick. With each new puzzle piece, it's either you're going to make one of three assertions. You're not really sure where it goes. You put it anywhere. Or it's like the red and white pieces, so you put it near the red and white pieces. Or you figure out right where it goes and you attach it. You favor the false negative. When's the last time you put a puzzle together at home and you said, you know, it doesn't fit so good, but with some glue and a hammer, I can get this little bastard in there. <laughs> you don't do that. It's just like if you see two Jeff Jonases in Vegas, you wouldn't just assume it's me because there happens to be another Jeff Jonas in Vegas. Sometimes new observations reverse earlier assertions. You were sure these two people were the same, same name, address, phone, but later you come to realize it's a junior and a senior. Some observations produce novel discovery. In a puzzle, it's just a, you find a piece that's just blades of grass, but it's the single piece that connects two very important scenes. And the emerging, as the picture emerges, it helps you focus your interest. In the beginning, when you're putting the puzzle together, you're just picking a piece and picking a piece. But let's say you get a bunch of red and white pieces that aren't coming together, and you become curious, and you want to create closure. You don't go to the box and just get the next piece. You go to the box and look for the red and white pieces. And organizations that are bringing context like this to their data are looking at how the data is being stitched together, and it inspires them about what data one would want to ingest next. Big data in context creates three things that I think are really exciting. One is the quality of the predictions get better, lower false positives and lower false negatives. Maybe it might be a surprise, but it turns out bad data is error in the data. Natural variability starts to become your friend. When you search Google and it says, did you mean this? It's not looking in a dictionary. It's remembered everybody's errors. If Google did not remember the errors, it wouldn't be so smart. And the third and final thing that is really exciting, and I think maybe the most exciting about what happens when you put big data in context, is there comes a point when it gets faster and faster to compute as the data gets larger. When you put a puzzle together at home and it's only this big, can you put it together on a table this big? No, it puffs out. The most expensive piece is when it has puffed out quite a bit, because there's so much ambiguity. But as the puzzle begins to collapse, you start to get more confident and faster where the pieces go. And I've seen this happen first in 2006 in a large database, where once we got to billions of records, the computational time it took per ingesting the next record was decreasing. And I, I find that really exciting. So there's a big difference between just a pile of big data and information in context. Now, in one of the earliest forms of context is entity resolution. Is it five people with one account or one person with five accounts? Who's Fang Wang? Which of these transactions are the real Fang Wang? And let's say it's these two. This entity resolution is figuring out it's really this person, so you've learned these things. And then, of course, after you resolve Fang Wang, you want to figure out the relationships between the resolved entities. And then if you're onboarding a new customer like Sandy Madden, you're trying to integrate this and saying, is it a known Sandy Madden or do we have a new one? And then you're graphing it. And while these examples here are just entities, are people, of course, it could be companies, cars, boats, planes, or asteroids. No, I'm not kidding. Literally, asteroids. One of the ways to make sense of data is how things are geospatially related to each other. And I... I went to the, University of, uh, uh, the uh, Institute of Astronomy at the University of Honolulu and sat down and got a little lesson from them about looking for asteroids. This is a picture from space. This is the challenge they have. These are just shiny dots. They don't know how far away they are. They have algorithms to figure out which of these shiny dots are always there. They're statics, so they take them away, and they're left with single detections, and these become candidates for asteroids. Now, with a single detection, you can't tell anything, just shiny dot. Most of these become orphans, they throw them in the trash, but if they can find another, shot, another dot, another candidate, another detection nearby, and they get two, they call it a tracklet. When they get to three, they call it a track. They have to get to four, five, six. You need six puzzle pieces to input to their algorithms to figure out the orbit in which they give it a name. They can forecast it to make sure it doesn't hit Earth. That's important. This is where we keep our stuff. I mentioned, hey, with these forecasts, you could maybe anticipate what's going to be somewhere someday. And they said that doesn't always happen like that. The asteroid may have rotated, and it's no longer being illuminated from the sun. And sometimes asteroids hit asteroids. I'm like, that's crazy. They go, yeah, it's only ever been seen twice after the fact. 
The first one in 2010, the Hubble just took a picture in space, and these two asteroids had hit each other, and it was a giant X in space. I'm like, that's cool, a giant X in space. Here is that giant X in space. And over a co course of um, a few months, it slowly dissipates. So I asked them the question, well, if you can forecast all these asteroids and know that they don't hit Earth, why don't you just forecast them to see if they hit each other? And they look at me like I'm a fool, and they, they said, but that's multi-body orbit math, which is expensive, and it's an n-squared problem. It's not like we have that much compute. There's 600,000 of these. And I said, yeah, but w why wouldn't you do it like this? And they went, no, that would work. So I'm going to show you that real quick. One of the things that we've been doing in context computing is creating, we created something called a space-time box. You're just trying to figure out if things are near each other in space and time. And I, I created these first for the Singaporeans to help them better protect the Malacca Straits with half the world's oil supply and a third of the world's commodities. And they're trying to figure out what vessel is the most interesting. And one thing to look for is when vessels hang out together. But with a billion records of historical data, you want to get some performance out of that. So here, this is Singapore, uh, right near the airport. The bigger boxes are about 610 meters. The smaller boxes are 19 meters. But for them, of course, we needed X, Y, and Z. So here's the technique. We use an existing algorithm for asteroids, and we ask the first of those 600,000 asteroids, where are you going to be tomorrow at noon? And that algorithm comes back and goes, oh, ho, ho, right here. And we go, yeah, 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 yeah. What zip code is that? And what we do is we plop it into a fairly large space-time box. Then we go to that same asteroid and say, where are you going to be tomorrow, the day, after, you know, the day after at noon? And it goes, oh, right here. And we're like, yeah, 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 yeah. What zip code is that? And we go and we do that for all the asteroids. And it turns out on any given day, only 2,000 asteroids are in the same zip code on the same day. Then what you do is you go back to just those two asteroids, and by the hour, you say, hey, where are you going to be at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m.? And in each of these cases, we just generalize it and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. What street is that? And it turns out so few asteroids are on the same street, tiny space-time box, on the same hour. That's where you apply the heavy compute. Doing it this way, generalizing space and time contextually like this for co-location, it took us less than three hours on a single node to do this. It takes us 15 minutes to do all 600,000. It takes us 15 minutes to integrate new ones. We have that running on Spark now, by the way, which is cool. Had they att attempted to do this with existing methods, 10 million computer hours and 4,000 hours to integrate each new asteroid. So huge improvement. We created a list, sent it to the astronomers. Let's look at the second one there, November 24, 2016. 500 kilometers apart, that's about 300 miles. This is super close in space talk. This is very exciting for them. We sent them the list, and then there was a long lull. And then in June, we get this email my, uh, to me and my uh, pals in IBM Research that helped me with this. And, you know, it's the first time they've ever trained the telescope and looked at somewhere to watch two asteroids come within close proximity. Here, if you watch this closely, you're the first publicly to see this. They were not able to follow them all the way through to their closest point because the sun came up. Damn it. We have a paper coming out on this, and I just want to say, if we save Earth, you're going to owe us. <laughs> okay, look, in closing, I think what's been happening is we've been taking data and we've been building algorithms to solve problems. Like maybe these are AML alg algorithms to study the red puzzle pieces, and maybe these algorithms here are just for marketing data, and now we want to study Twitter, so we build algorithms to study Twitter. I think the future is going to look more like this, where we weave data together more generally, data finding data, and I think the better of a job that we do with this, the easier it is, to be, is going to be to figure out what is relevant to who. That's context computing, and one of the things that we will be doing with this is it helps focus human attention. It says which customer is the best prospect, which fraud transaction is, which transaction with the credit card is the most, most possibly fraudulent, or to tell the astronomers where to look in space. So my recommendations for making data work, generally we need to be widening observation spaces. That means more data. You have to put it in the context if you want to get real value out of it. There are huge, huge gains in what's going to be possible in so many domains. And of course, we're going to be using Hadoop and Spark to really accelerate this. I blog here. I answer every email I get from everybody. I'm super accessible. If I don't catch you in the halls here and you want to chat, you'll find me at Datapalooza in San Francisco. Thank you. Have a good conference.